Well, thanks guys. Um, like Tree said, my name's Pete and we'll just keep this real low key. Um, if you guys have questions, feel free to raise your hand, holler out, hey Pete, and uh, we'll try to get them answered for you anytime. Um, like Tree said, I've been working with bison for a while. Um, I raised my own bison. I have a couple friends that had herds I've helped out with over the years. And then when I went and did a PhD at Iowa State, I ended up working with bison. Yeah. Yeah, when uh, we get all done today, you got to come on up and you can check them out real close. So for I sure. Touch one of the two. Okay, good deal. But yeah, I, I studied uh, bison and seed dispersal in tall grass prairie ecosystems. So got to do a lot with the uh, Neil Smith herds and the, the TNC herds down in Missouri at Broken Kettle and at uh, the Dunn Ranch prairie remnants and things like that. So it seems like bison have been part of my life for a long time now. But I think, uh, you know, before we get going, we got to throw one thing out there. Is it bison or is it buffalo? Anybody know? Both. Yeah, the answer is yes, both. <laughs> <laughs> so technically, if, if we're talking with science folks, it's bison. That's the scientific name, bison, bison. And so if I go to a biology conference and I'm talking with other biologists, I'm going to talk about bison because if I say buffalo, they're going to think I'm talking about an Asiatic water buffalo or an African cape buffalo. And I want to know, I'm, no, I'm talking about bison. But if I go to my family reunion and I'm talking to great aunt Tilly and she says, aren't you the guy that studies buffalo? I say, yes, I am actually. I'm not going to argue with her because we've actually been calling them buffalo in this continent for about 300 years. So why change now, right? So you can say buffalo, you can say bison. It, it doesn't really matter. But uh, here on planet Earth, we've got two species of bison. So there's the North American bison that we're all familiar with. That's what these guys are. And then if you go over to Europe, there's bison bonassis or the European bison, sometimes called the visant. And it's a little bit different. You, if you looked at it, you'd say, yeah, it looks like a buffalo. Um, this is the one that you'd see like in cave paintings in Southern France and Northern Spain. And uh, unlike our bison, which is a, a prairie creature, the European bison is a forest animal. It lives in the woodlands. It eats a lot of acorns as well as grasses and sedges. And so there's a few of those still roaming around in national parks like in Poland and parts of Russia and stuff like that. And their story is a lot like our bison where they were almost made extinct. In fact, uh, there was a few still running around in the wild and then World War II came along, the Germans invaded Poland and the Nazis pretty much ate them all. So they were just gone from the wild. The only ones that lived uh, were still alive, were in zoos. And from that, just like our bison, they started breeding programs and they, they took about less than 100 animals and built them up to the population we have today. So if you go over to Eastern Europe, you, know, you can probably still see them in some of the zoos and parks and national forests and things like that. Uh, but over here in North America, we have two main kinds of bison. Um, the ones that I brought with me today, that's a hide from a two and a half year old bull right there. So he's about half grown. Um, this one would have been a comparable skull from a, a bison that size. So this is a two year old bison here, two and a half years old. Uh, these horns come from about a one year old animal, a yearling. And then this bull, he was about six or seven years old. So they get quite a bit bigger, but these are all plains bison, which would be technically the subspecies bison, bison, bison. It's a really easy <laughs> scientific name to remember. So that's why I picked those guys for my PhD. It's totally easy. <laughs> if you go up north to Canada, you'll run into a, one that looks a little bit different. It's called bison bison at the basket or the wood bison or the wood buffalo. Now, technically right now, they still have subspecies status, right? But recent genetic evidence has shown that these guys are all just one big species. And if we look at the, the animals that live in the southern grasslands, versus the animals that live in the, the open meadows of the northern forest, the, pretty much the only thing difference is what we would call pheno, phenotypic variation, or they look different, right? So there's no distinction between them genetically. In fact, uh, some of the genetic papers I read said that there's more genetic difference between breeds of domestic cows, like between a Hereford and an Angus, than there is between these two kinds of bison. Um, but if you were to look at them and you knew your bison, you could say, yeah, that's a wood buffalo or that's a, that's a plains bison. And the main difference is, number one, their hair is a little bit different. Wood buffalo tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, but if you look at the shoulder of a plains bison, you know how they've got that really shaggy front end and it's really slick, especially in the summertime, like horse hair in the back. And there's a line. You can just draw it right from behind their shoulder blade. Oh, this is their shaggy front half. This is their, you know, thin haired back half. 
And that's what you see on a plains bison. On a wood bison up north, it's a real fuzzy line. You can't really tell where the back hair and the front hair starts. So that's one way you can tell the difference. The other way is to look at their head hair. On the Great Plains, the, our plains bison have this really curly mop of hair. And then a wood buffalo has a really like straight hair. So yeah, on, on a, a plains bison like this guy, if he was alive, his hair would almost completely cover those horns. You know, they would not even stick up above his head and they might even get lost in his hair. Whereas on a wood buffalo, their horns come out wider and they go up taller so you can see them outside their hair. And then the other main difference when you look at their hump, on a plains bison it just kind of goes up and it has one big hump. On a wood bison it goes up and kind of dips and goes again like he has a double hump. And so it's pretty subtle differences, but they can, they can interbreed. And of course, in southern Canada, where their ranges would have overlapped, they almost certainly were interbreeding. Um, but I remember a few years ago, I was at a bison conference in Montana, and I was, a guy had just given a talk about reintroducing wood bison to Alaska. And I went to him in the hall afterwards, and I said, hey, what do you think of the new genetic stuff that says they're all just one big species? There's no more subspecies designation. And he got right, kind of ticked off. You know, he's all up in my face and he's like, they still have legal subspecies status and we will continue to create them as a subspecies. And I was like, whoa, dude, I was just asking. But, uh, you know, for him, it was part of his daily job. Like that endangered subspecies status meant they got a lot more protection, more grant money funding, their habitat was protected. And so he's thinking from a, a standard of if we lose this status, all these other species that are benefiting from the protection of these bison goes out the window. And so he was really kind of uptight about it. But it's kind of the same thing as the Florida panther. You know, they've been an endangered species for years. And then the geneticists came along and says, well, actually, they're the same as all the other cougars in the United States. But they still have that legal protection because the, the laws were put in place before genetics really came about. So we got two subspecies technically still. Um, but basically two kinds of bison that look different from north to south. So back when I was doing my PhD research, um, I was working primarily at Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge up by Des Moines. You guys ever been up there? And one of the things that was kind of rumored to be coming down the pipe, not from the biologists and the managers that work there, but from the, the upper ups in the, the Fish and Wildlife Service was this idea that we should just get rid of these bison and replace them with cattle because cattle would be so much easier to work with and of course you know the biologists are thinking well who's going to drive off of highway 163 to come see some cows nobody right but people by the hundreds come every weekend or on their way home from work and they, oh let's go by and, and see the buffalo yeah so buffalo are kind of like the gateway drug to prairie restoration <laughs> You know, it gets people hooked and then they start thinking about sunflowers and Indian, you know, all that stuff. And so uh, they were really keen to keep uh, the bison on the place and not replace them with cattle. And so one of the things they mentioned to me said, hey, while you're out there doing all this dissertation research, um, can you kind of be thinking in the back of your head, like what makes bison different from cattle? Are these things that we could, could really replace with cattle or are they something that, you know, they're unique to the system and, and wouldn't be replaced by cattle? And so I imagine, you know, just looking at them, you can tell, well, they're similar. They're both, they're both bovids. They're, they're both ruminants, right? So they, they both eat a lot of grass and other plants and, and they have that four chambered stomach. So that goes in and it you know, gets partially digested. And, and then you kids probably know this, right? They kind of barf their food back up in their mouth and they chew it again. Yeah, sounds kind of gross. Would you want to do that? <laughs> it's not as bad as a rabbit, right? You guys know what rabbits do? They poop their food out and then eat it again. Yeah, don't do that at home, okay? Yeah, but it works for rabbits and that's how they get all the nutrients out of that grass and clover that they eat. Because if you guys tried to eat grass, it's not gonna work for us, right? I mean, we could literally go out there and chew the grass on the lawn, just like a cow, and we could fill our bellies with grass and feel totally full, but we would still starve to death because we can't extract the nutrients out of the grass that a bison or a cow can. They have special enzymes that work on it. They have special bacteria that lives in their guts that we don't, that help break down that cellulose. So for us, eating grass would be like eating cardboard. Right? It's mostly cellulose and our bodies can't digest that very well. 
but bison have bacteria and enzymes and they chew it twice and by all those different processes, they have this really, really long intestine tract that allows them to squeeze out all the good nutrients from that. Whereas we would just pass it through and we wouldn't be able to get enough vitamins and minerals to able, even survive. So both cows and bison, um, they are ruminants and they chew their cud and they look kind of the same. But one of the big differences we, we see in, in bison versus cows is behavior. So I'm sure you guys, maybe if you've ever been out to Yellowstone or you've been to a park that has bison, you've seen those big bare patches of dirt where the bison roll back and forth on the ground. It's what we call bison wallows. And that's something that a bison does that a, a domestic cow just doesn't do. So they create these big patches, sometimes oh, about 10 feet across, a big circle of dirt, sometimes as big as this shelter house right here. Just you know, a whole bunch of them come together. And there's a lot of different reasons why bison wallow. Uh, a friend of mine actually studied this when he was working with bison in Utah, and he found out that the number one reason that they do this is in the summertime to get rid of biting insects like flies and gnats. They can roll back and forth in the dust and it kicks those flies away. But they do it for a lot of other stuff too. They do it for social reasons. Like during the breeding season, the bulls will get down on one knee and they'll roll back and forth. They actually pee in the wallow and they kick up that nice bison pee smell in the air. And, and it, it shows the other bulls that, hey, I'm a tough guy. You don't want to mess with me. And then they also do it, well, just kind of like social bonding. Like females will do this, calves will do this. And so I remember one time I was out doing research in the field we were watching this herd of bison and and we had just like torn up some old fence posts and stuff like that and created this big patch of bare dirt and the, the bison herd came along and the first one stopped and he got down and he wallowed he rolls back and forth and kicks up a bunch of the dust second one came did the same thing third one fourth one you know like 35 bison later every single one of them stops and wallows just to be like hey i'm a bison you're a bison hey we're all wallowing in the dust yeah so that's what they do um, and so in so doing, they create these little micro habitats. Imagine you went out with a rototiller and you plowed up a piece of ground, right? And then you came back and you mowed the lawn around that bare patch of ground, oh, say every week or so. That's basically what bison are doing. They create this little garden patch that allows all kinds of plants to grow in that bare dirt. And what I was studying, remember I looked at seed dispersal? They carry around a lot of seeds that get stuck in their fur. And when they roll back and forth, it kind of plants it in that bare dirt. And then grasses are some of the plants that grow really, really well on the prairie. And that's what they like to eat the most. So they will eat and eat and eat all the grass and they really don't touch the flowers. And so you start to see a bigger diversity of flowers growing around those bison wallows. And so when you look at them, you can actually, with your eyes, see that, oh yeah, this patch of vegetation around these wallows, it's different than out in the prairie where there's no wallows. So they create a lot more diversity in the prairie by doing that. And cows just don't do that. When it comes to what they eat, mostly they eat grass, like 95% of their diet is grass and things like sedges and rushes, what we call graminoids. Whereas things that have broad leaves, like what we would call prairie flowers, they don't eat those as much. A, a domestic cow will eat a lot more prairie flowers or a lot more broad leaf plants out in the, in the pasture. So they like clovers and a lot of different kinds of weed species that grow up in pastures. The other thing we see that's a lot different is in their herd structure. Do you guys know that bison are matriarchal? You guys know what that word means, matriarchal? It means the girls are in charge, just like elephants. So when it comes to a bison herd, um, they get into groups of about 100 or less. Once they get more than that, they tend to split off and make two herds. Uh, but that herd will be run by a lead cow, like an old grandma. And she's been around the block a few times. She knows where all the grass is, where the good water is, where to hang out, where to watch out for the wolves or that grizzly bear that's always down by the creek. And she kind of leads them to good food and keeps them safe. And then she'll be in that herd with all her female relatives and you know some other unrelated females too, but you know her sisters and her aunts and her cousins and things like that. And then all the kids up until about age three. So it doesn't matter if you're a boy bison or a girl bison, you stay with mom and all the girls until you're about three. And then three years old, that's kind of about teenage years for bison. And that's when the boys go off and start doing stuff by themselves. They don't want to be around mom or sisters anymore. They want to hang with their friends. And so they go off in little satellite groups with other bulls about the same age, maybe the year they were born or within a year of their age. And they hang out and they do lots of stupid stuff. And that's usually when they get killed. So. <laughs> 
most of the time, a bison has a really good chance of living till next year. There's hardly anything that can kill a bison, you know, other than like a wolf or maybe a grizzly bear now and then. Uh, but when they get to be teenagers, they start, you know, jumping off cliffs or getting in fights or doing things to show off for the girls, driving their car too fast, and, and they end up getting killed. So that's when they break legs and they get, you know, knocked around and drowned in floods and that stuff. And then once they get past that, then they're a little bit smarter and wiser and, and they don't get killed as much. Yeah. Do they fight among themselves? Yeah, during the breeding season, especially. Um, during the rest of the year, they're pretty happy to be around, you know, other bison. But yeah, um, right now we're at the tail end of the bison rut or the breeding season. It usually starts in mid-July and then goes to about the middle of August, lasts about a month or six weeks, depending on where you are. And uh, yeah, that's when the bulls really start fighting each other. Oh, that's his jaw. So that would be this part right here. So if you're ever canoeing in the river or you're walking in the creek and you find a jawbone like this and you want to know, is this a bison jaw or is this just an old farmer's cow? Uh, the best way to tell is first look at the color. So if it's light colored like this, that means this probably died last year. It's not an old bison from 200 years ago, right? So if it's dark brown or even black, then it means it's really old. But of course it could be a really old cow, right? Like one that died 50 years ago. So the best way to tell is look at the width of the jaw. Um, on a domestic cattle jaw, it would be much wider than this. This is kind of skinny compared to a domestic cow's jaw. And when you look at the angle that that jaw comes away from here on a domestic cow, it'd be about 90 degrees, whereas this is more about 60 degrees. So a smaller angle and then a, a thinner jawbone, and you know you got a bison instead of a farmer's cow. But yeah, during the, during the breeding season, the males, um, you know, like you always see YouTube videos and stuff like out in Yellowstone where they're fighting and things like that. But generally they only do that if they're about evenly matched. Most of the time, if they're, you know, one smaller or younger, then they end up not fighting. So yeah, during the rut is probably the best time to go viewing bison. Like if you're on vacation in Yellowstone or you just go up to Neil Smith during like late July, um, use your ears because you'll hear them calling at first. Um, they sound almost like lions roaring. It's a real deep guttural growl. Like, and that low frequency you know, sound just carries across the open grassland for a long way. So other bison can hear them. And then um, if you're really close, you'll feel it. Yeah. Yeah, so if they get to where there's another bull, and generally the bulls don't even get a chance to breed till they're about five years old. Before that, I mean, they, physically they could breed, but they're just too small. They get chased away by the bigger ones. Once they get to be about five, you know, then they're weighing upwards of 1,500 pounds or more. And so that's when they're big enough and they can challenge the other bulls. So most of the time, you know, you see two bulls come together, first thing they're going to do is they're going to turn sideways and they're gonna show off their profile. You know, like when you guys watch pro wrestling, you know, like WWE, and they flex their muscles, and they start talking smack to the other guy they're gonna fight, say, I can take you in two seconds. That's what they're doing. They're showing off. So if you ever notice, like in the summer, uh, bison have those really long beards, and they've got, you know, a long cape and everything like that. Um, that's what we think is a fitness indicator, just like antlers on a deer. So it shows off not only to the rival males, but also to the females. It says, hey, look at my luscious locks. Look at this great beard. I get enough to eat. I have a low parasite load. I don't have any weird viruses. Um, you know, all this extra energy I've got can go into this thing that I don't really need, but it tells the other males that, oh, that guy, he's strong. And it tells the females, oh, he's got good genetics. I would like to have some kids with him. And so, yeah, the first thing they do is, turn sideways, they kind of size each other up, and that's usually where it ends. One of them says, oh, that guy's way bigger than me, I'm out of here. But if they're about the same size, then they start posturing, that's when you start hearing the growling, says, this is my female, stay away, I've been here for like half an hour, she's mine. And, and then they start going down on one knee, and they'll go in those wallows where that's already dusty anyway, and they kick up the dust, and they start urinating all over, and that, that hormone that gets in the air, it, also, it sends a signal to the males that, hey, you don't want to mess with me. And it's also been shown to cause the females to go into heat, start ovulating. Say, smell the sexy perfume. You know you want it. <laughs> and so once that little show gets over, then they face off. 
And if the guy still doesn't back off, then they start clashing heads. And it's usually just a matter of smashing into the other guy. And the one that's faster and gets a, a horn in the other guy's eye or in his ribs, or the one that's heavier and can push him out of the way, he ends up winning. And the other, you know, one of them eventually quits after a few minutes. Yeah. They don't, they don't fight to the death. No, not generally, although they'll sometimes get injured to the point where it kills them later. Um, but yeah, usually just you know, kind of push each other back and forth till they figure out oh, one guy's stronger. What's yeah. Normal lifespan for a long time. Um, so like 30 or 40 years. Oh, yeah, especially for the cows can live a long time. Males, like I said, you know, they injure themselves, they fight and, and stuff. So you know, more like 30 years for them. But yeah, most domestic cows will have calves like up till they're about 10 or so. Bison can have calves up until they're 25. Oh, yeah, 30 sometimes. So they live quite a while. Um, the one downside, like if you're trying to raise them for beef production kind of thing, they only usually have a calf every other year, where a, a normal you know, domestic cow has a calf every spring. Um, these guys only have a calf every other year and hardly ever see twins. It's super rare to see twins. So when you guys do go to Neil Smith or Yellowstone or wherever, the one thing you always want to watch out for is their tail. That's their warning flag. And if you go home and you watch some YouTube videos, um, this is always, well, it's tragic, but it's kind of funny. At the same time, when you see those like tourists that get slammed by the bison or whatever, they always have the little headline, bison comes out of nowhere, slams into this tourist. And then you watch the thing and like, okay, well, there was that guy and he was trying to take a picture and he got a little closer and the tail went straight up. That should have been your first warning. The higher the tail goes, the more agitated they are. And so, you know, the bison's sitting there for like 10 minutes saying, dude, you are way too close. Come on, back off. You're in my bubble. Give me some space. And the guy just, oh, let me get a little closer. <laughs> Honey, why don't you stand next to him? And then pretty soon he starts pawing and he goes sideways. He says, look how massive I am. You don't want to mess with me. Oh, that's great. I'm going to get another shot. And then finally, after about 15 minutes of this guy and just getting closer and closer, says, all right, I've had it. Bam. And that's when he gets hit. Uh, but if you watch that tail, the first thing it starts to do when they're a little bit nervous, it raises a little. And that means, hey, you're too close. And if you back off, it goes back down and they turn around, they start eating grass again. No big deal. If you keep getting closer, the tail goes higher and higher. And if it's straight up, that means you really need to get out of there. Um, and that's what you look for when you're around them. So during the rut, you don't want to be around a bull because they think you're another rival and they'll charge you. The other really dangerous time around bison for humans is during calving season. So that'd be like in the middle of May, um, right about the same time white-tailed deer are having their babies when the grass is nice and green and the weather's warm. That's when they start dropping calves. And if you get between a mom and her baby, she's going to let you have it. And I've had that happen to me before. Um, when I had bison on my own ranch, I remember one time, uh, I had a calf that got stuck in a, a fence. It got its head stuck through a woven wire fence. And I thought, oh no, I gotta get this guy out. Well, mom was having none of it. And she was pawing and ready to slam me. Luckily, I had my blue healer with me. And she ran out and she barked and bit that bison cow's nose until I could get the calf out of the fence. And then turn him loose and he ran back with mom and then she was totally happy and they trotted back up to the pasture. Um, but luckily, the dog was with me that day or it could have been a bad story. But yeah, bison are, uh, probably the only animal that's over 2,000 pounds that survived the Ice Age. We think about all the other Ice Age fauna, mammoths, mastodons, giant ground sloths, all those guys are extinct. But the bison was around in the Ice Age and he's the only big animal that we still have with us, something that's over a ton. And when you look at them today and you see how they you know, live in the winter time, they are really you know, winter adapted critters, you know, super ice age animals. That's why they can survive blizzards in North Dakota where, you know, cows get in a bad snowstorm and they start huddling together and then they drift over them to the neighbor's fence and they get lost in the snowstorm. Whereas bison always turn into the wind and then the head, you know, it's all fuzzy and they got those big long, you know, front hair and they just face into the wind and then, uh, you know, they, they stand it really well. Um, there was a study was done back in the late 70s up in Canada where they are trying to test the cold hardiness of different ungulates and so they took six-month-old calves of a bison and then they took a Tibetan yak you know the big shaggy ones from like the, the Mount Everest kind of area and they took a regular like Angus bull calf and then a, a Scottish Highland calf you know like a six-month-old animal so these are like half-grown animals and they wanted to see well at what temperature do they get when they start to feel cold? You know, like you guys have a, 
what we call a, a, a normal temperature where you feel comfortable, right? And for most humans in Iowa, that's probably like 70 degrees. You, know, you go outside and you're like, oh, it's not too hot, it's not too cold, I just feel fine, right? And then if you get too cold, you start bringing in all your extremities and you start to shiver and, and then maybe you think about go getting a coat and stuff like that. Well, what they're trying to do is figure out well, what temperature is that where these animals start to shiver. And so they, they measured it by um, looking at carbon dioxide output because usually when we get cold before we start feeling it, our bodies kick into high gear and start digesting all the food we just put down it. Cellular respiration creates more carbon dioxide. And if you don't have any food, then it starts burning through your fat reserves to keep you warm. That's why grizzly bears and black bears eat lots and lots of stuff to make it through the winter. Deer do the same thing. And so they put these animals like in a sort of a refrigerated box car type of situation. They started cranking down the temperature and they said, okay, well, what point does this animal start shivering and feel cold? And so they got it down to 20 degrees Fahrenheit and the Hereford cow or the Angus, the domestic cow they had said, oh, it's too cold. And they started shivering. So they yanked that one. And then they got it down to about 10 degrees Fahrenheit and the Scottish Highland cow and the Tibetan yak bow said, oh, feels too cold. You know, I, I got to warm up. I got to eat some food. I got to run around. They cranked it all the way down to negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit, which is as low as their instruments could get. And the bison was still like, ah, oh, feels fine. I'm, I'm comfy. <laughs> this is great. And so, yeah, that shows you how they can, you know, survive in those ice age conditions and just be totally cool with it. I remember one time uh, on my farm when I had both bison and cattle at the same time, it was one of those cold, snowy days, like 10 degrees, and I thought, oh, I better get out there and, and give them some extra hay. And I went out to the barn, and all the beef cows were just huddled up against the barn, shivering, begging for hay. And I thought, well, where's the bison? They're nowhere around here. So finally, I hiked around. I looked, and way up on the hill, out in the pasture, they're just out running around, playing, having a good old time. Like, yeah, it's fine. It feels great. So yeah, lots of differences between cows and bison. You got wallowing behavior, Herd structure is different. You know, they, they go off with cow calves instead of just hanging out all together. They eat things a little bit different. Their water um, intake is also different. I know if you've ever been out west, a lot of times on like BLM land or on you know, forest service land where ranchers graze their cattle, um, they talk a lot about riparian damage You because know, the cow herds get around a pond or a creek and they just stay there close to water and they eat all the plants and the willows and they muddy things up and make it bad for fish and stuff like that. A um, friend of mine down in Oklahoma did a study once where he took 40 Angus cows and he took 40 bison cows and he put GPS collars on them and then they put them both out in tall grass prairie because they got a lot more of it down in Oklahoma than we do in Iowa. And, uh, and then they just watched them for a couple years and they say, well, where do they go and how, when do they eat and when do they go get drinks and stuff like that. And he found that the, the domestic cattle, once they found a water source, especially in the summer, would just hang out there the whole time. Just stay there, stay there. We don't want to get too far from water. Whereas the bison, you know, they drink just like anything else, but they'd come and they'd drink and then they'd wander off and they'd go maybe a day away and then eventually come back and get some more drinks and then wander off. So they weren't just beating down the creek bottom all the time. So their water consumption's a little bit different too. And then does anybody know like how many bison we used to have around here? Because we don't have that many now. What do you think? 30 million. There you go, 30 million. That's a nice conservative estimate. You'll see 60 million, you'll see 20 million, but I, I would put my money on about 30 million. Um, this would have been in the mid 1800s. You know, so early 1800s to mid 1800s. And this is a, a time period when like a lot of wildlife, bison were kind of on the rebound. So their populations were going up. So when most settlers started moving out to the west, they were looking at a population that had been much lower earlier and now is much higher. You know, just like all wildlife populations, they go up some years, they go down, depending on droughts and fires and floods and food availability and predators. And of course, America's wildlife uh, had lost one of their major predators in the last hundred years or so. Anybody know what that was? Wasn't wolves. No, this is like early 1800s. Still plenty of wolves running around. Grizzly Not the grizzlies. Still a lot of grizzlies. What's the other big predator of bison? Do you know? Saber Not saber tooth. They were gone way a long time ago. The Ice Buffalo, Age. Buffalo Bill. Well, not Buffalo Bill. Indians. Yeah, it was people. Indians. Um, so used to have much higher population of Native Americans. 
you know, back in the, you know, say the 1600s, when a lot of the early explorers were coming to North America, they talked about, you know, just fires burning constantly all up and down the East Coast. You know, all these villages and farm fields and huge populations. But then, of course, they brought with them not only their guns and technology and steel, they brought their diseases. So these novel viruses that the Indians had never encountered swept across North America. And it's estimated it wiped out about half the population of North America with things like smallpox and cholera and things like that. So we think we got virus problems today. They lost 50% of their population. And so when all those people were not on the landscape and not hunting and eating bison and deer and elk and everything else, wildlife populations filled that vacuum and shot up. And so now you got people moving on to the plains, but there's still plenty of Native Americans around, but half of what there would have been, say 100 or 150 years before. And so, yeah, that's when you see like 30 million bison. That's where they talk about, you know, the transcontinental railroad going across Nebraska and Wyoming and, you know, the, the herds stopping the train for two or three days at a time because there's so many animals moving in front of them. Now, chances are that was midsummer during the breeding season when lots of herds were coming together and mingling. Uh, but still, I mean, that's like an impressive sight to see. Yeah. So bison was the original American red meat. For sure, yeah, along with deer and elk and everything else. population eating bison, bison um, Well, there was a time when bison stretched pretty much from coast to coast. You know, the, the Great Plains has always been their stronghold. You know, they've, the population kind of ebbed and flowed out of the Great Plains. But there have been times when, yeah, they've been on the East Coast, they've been in Florida, they've been in the West Coast. Um, but yeah, I don't know if you could say like everybody in North America was eating bison, but surely, it, you know, almost everybody on the Great Plains would have been. But yeah, it was, you know, depending on where you live, some people ate a lot more ducks and some people ate more turtles and some people ate more cattails and acorns. And, you know, there's a lot of different food things. Um, so I stopped eating red meat uh, cows yep. at 24. Sure. Because it, it, it takes three days to digest. It's way too heavy. It's yeah. Like, whoa, I said, man, it's just sitting there. So a number of years ago, I started eating bison. Yeah. And it was, it's great. And I think if more Americans were eating buffalo burgers and steaks, I think they'd be healthy. One of the things you got to watch out for is when you get your bison, is look how it was raised and slaughtered and all that. Um, because yeah, there, you're right, there's a lot of health benefits to bison meat, just like if you eat deer or elk that's been out running around the woods. Um, they always say it's like lower cholesterol, low fat and all that kind of stuff. But the main difference is most, not all, but most of our domestic cattle are raised for the last five or six months of their life on corn, right? So you feed them in the grass here in Iowa and then you take them to the sale barn when they're about a year and a half old and then they ship them to Nebraska or Colorado and they put them in a feedlot where they get corn and molasses and the idea is to build up lots and lots of weight fast. And that's something that we really only started in this country about World War I, or right after World War I. Huge grain surplus after the war, because we weren't feeding the boys overseas. And so they said, what are we gonna do with all this corn? And so this is kind of the original value-added agriculture. And they said, well, what can we do with this surplus? I know, let's feed it to livestock. We got chickens, we got pigs, we got cows, all this kind of stuff. And they found out that you could take a year and a half old cow, basically a teenage cow, and you feed them chips and candy bars and don't give them much room to move around, put a video game right in front of them, don't let them get any exercise, and he'll put on the same fat content as a middle-aged cow. So it used to be you sold your steers at market when they are four or five years old. That's when they had enough marbling, they were middle-aged, that their meat was tender and that's what people like to eat. And so when they had all this surplus grain, they figured out, oh, we can get these 18 month old cows to market much faster. And so, yeah, when you, when you do that, you have a lot more fat in your meat. And of course, these days they trim it off at the butcher, which is kind of weird, uh, but you still have that marbling. And that's where you run into some of those health problems, you know, like cholesterol and stuff like that. Whereas some of the bison that you like go to hy and buy, they're raised in those same conditions. They send them into the feedlot because they know that's what the consumer wants. If you go to somebody's farm, and you just buy you know, a quarter of a bison or whatever that's been out in the pasture, it's gonna have all those health benefits that you want, more like a deer or an elk where it doesn't have that marbling. And so you gotta cook it a little bit different. If you want it to taste like a nice juicy steak, don't make it well done because it'll be like shoe leather. Um, the key with bison or deer or any lean meat is cook it at low temperatures for a longer time. 
and then it'll come out nice and tender. You know, I, I never want to eat a well done bison steak or a deer steak. I always want it rare because it's going to be a lot more tender and tasty and stuff like that. But yeah, you, you definitely got to look at how that bison was finished. Was it grass finished? Was it, you know, on a feedlot kind of thing too, for sure. Do you have a question here, bud? In Iowa, there's a few. There's probably like five right now. Um, I don't know their names, but they're coming from Wisconsin mostly, and sometimes even Missouri. So Arkansas had a whole bunch of black bears that moved up into Missouri. Well, they walked. So yeah, you know, like, you know, when you're probably about 20, you're gonna be thinking, ah, I better get a job, maybe find myself a nice girl, settle down. You're probably not gonna wanna live in dad's basement, right? You probably wanna move somewhere, get your own place. Nobody tells you not to quit playing Xbox and drinking soda and stuff like that. You can do whatever you want. Well, that's what the bears are doing. When they get away from mom, they say, I got to get find my own place. And sometimes they wander into Iowa. So yeah, there's a few coming up from Missouri. But, uh, you know, they show up and they go back and they come down from Wisconsin. And I bet you by the time you have grandkids, somebody says, are there bears in Iowa? And you say, well, yeah, of course there's bears in Iowa. We've had bears around here for years. There'll be a population again someday. Yeah, you might have. Do you have a question, bud? Are, are those both different kinds of... They're the same species, just different ages. This one was about six or seven years old. This one was two and a half years old. So yeah, this one was younger and that one was older. What happened to the idea of the beefalo? You know, 30 years ago... Oh, were... yep. And they're still around. Beefalo. Uh, yeah, beefalo is actually... a. genes or what? Well, no, they just bred them. Um, and it's... It's actually real specific. I think it's seven eighths cattle and one eighth bison is a oh. beefalo. Oh. Um, but yeah, it was something that they bred and they, they can still find people that raise them. It's just, it never took off and became this huge thing like they thought it would. But basically what they were trying to do is get the, you know, the ease of handling of the domestic cow with the hardiness, the winter toughness the, and stuff like that of the bison. But uh, yeah, every once in a while, uh, bison and cattle interbreed. It's kind of a rare happening, but it does happen. You know, back in the day, you know, 1900 or so, there was probably less than 500 bison on the planet. You know, that was just, there wasn't that many. And they got rounded up and some, you know, were rounded up by Indian tribes and some were collected by private ranchers in Montana and Texas and Wyoming. And of course they had cows already and the neighbors had cows and sometimes the fences went down and, and things happen and nature took its course and you end up with, with hybrids. Um, generally, uh, it only works if you take a female bison and a male domestic bull and if they have a female calf, it usually works. And if they have a male calf, they're sometimes sterile. And if you go the other way, if you just said, oh, I'm going to get one bison bull and put them in with my domestic females, it doesn't work at all. They just, they don't, either don't get pregnant or the babies come out stillborn, things like that. So about 25% of the time, it works. But that was enough that we ended up with half-breed bison cows and they started beefalo and, and stuff like that. And yeah, trees. Population of uh, bison, are they descended from any specific population from the past? Yeah, pretty much. Um, so we started out with, you know, we'll say 30 million, big number. Now we're down to like 100,000, you know, and that number is uh, 100,000 that we sort of know to be what we would say genetically pure bison, like not mixed with cows. There's probably twice that number that have cattle genes. And we've only been able to figure this out in the last 20 years or so. And, um, it was Jim Durr down at Texas A&M, he's the big bison geneticist, that he started doing work and he looked at all these different herds and, you know, places like Yellowstone and the Black Hills and all over and private herds and he found out that there was only six herds in the whole country that didn't have cattle genes mixed in with them. And so then that kind of made some red flags and people said, oh my goodness, and we better be really careful with this stuff we got left. Not that they've ever really been able to tell if there's any difference between a cow with, or a bison with cattle genes, but just for safety's sake, they said, well, let's, let's err on the side of caution and not let these guys mix up. Um, so yeah, those original herds came from Yellowstone, number one, there's still a, a wild herd in Yellowstone. In fact, that's one of the reasons how Yellowstone Park got like park rangers and stuff. It's because even though they said, okay, it's a national park, woohoo. Um, 
you can't go in and hunt the elk, you can't hunt the bison, but there was nobody around to enforce the laws. And so poachers still went in there and shot them. And it was actually uh, the main way that it came to people's attention is a guy who was writing for a magazine called Forest and Stream. We call it Field and Stream today. He went in there, he was tracking this on the trail of this poacher that went in and shot a bunch of bison in the Pelican Valley and then was selling the hides and the meat and stuff. And so he wrote up an article and it sort of gained national attention and then folks like Theodore Roosevelt and John F. Lacey. You guys been to Lacey Kiyosaka State Park? Yeah, so our congressman John F. Lacey said, hey, we gotta do something about it so we're not gonna have any of these bison left that we've been trying to save for the last five years. And so he said, well, we gotta send in the army. So they did that. And they said, you guys enforce the laws in the park. And then eventually that developed into these things they called park rangers that would go out and ride the range and, and enforce the laws in the park and keep the wildlife from getting shot and stuff like that. And who specifically were those soldiers? Uh, just Army was the original ones, oh, but I'm not sure which buffalo. unit. It might have been Buffalo. The first ones were Buffalo. Okay, buffalo. yeah, good deal. So yeah, the um, Yellowstone herd was a big one and then um, there was like Charles Goodnight and a few other private ranchers across the West that just rounded up calves and put them in and started raising them and their herds got bigger and bigger. And, and then eventually, um, like William T. Hornaday, he was the director for the Bronx Zoo at the time. He was pretty instrumental in saving them. He gathered up lots and then they raised them on, in the zoo in New York City um, as a big breeding program. When they got enough, they said, okay, we gotta put these back. We'll reintroduce them to the wild. And this is at a time when there's really no wild bison running around. And so they started a, a national bison rage in Oklahoma and then one in Montana. And they said, okay, here's gonna be the start. And from there, places like uh, Custer State Park started getting theirs and then eventually other, you know, like county parks and state parks and things like that picked up different herds and people started raising them like beef cattle and some private ranches and farms. And so from there, it just kind of spread all over till they built up numbers. Bison travel? Oh, I'd say probably 50 miles in a year and maybe 500 miles over a five or six year. So kind of like elk in that respect. You know, they, there's a lot of old stories about maybe bison migrating, like geese or something, where they go to Canada and then they go to Mexico. And, and that's probably not the case. A um, friend of mine, he works for the Illinois Natural History Survey. When he was doing his PhD, he studied stable isotope analysis of bison remains from all these different archeological sites all over the Great Plains, and he got some from Iowa. And by looking at strontium and, ice and oxygen isotopes, he could basically take samples from the bones and tell where on the map they had been eating grass and drinking for the most of their life. And then you can mark points on the map and say, well, he started life as a calf here, and he ended up as a 10-year-old, you know, 500 miles away. Um, things like that. And so they weren't probably making those long distance migrations. Although I wonder if, and this is just speculation, but I wonder if, you know, having tall grass prairie here in the east and short grass prairie in the west, if there wasn't some seasonal east-west migrations, like coming to Iowa for the green up in April and eating all the grass, and then as it got taller and taller and started to bug their eyes, moving across the Missouri River and out in Nebraska where you had mixed grass and short grass prairie. There could have been some of that, but we don't really know. The pioneer accounts are kind of sketchy. You know, most of the people that were, well, most people didn't write about them at all because they were just common and they're like, well, you know, they're out there, they're bison. And the few people that did, didn't really take scientific notes. It's like, saw some buffalo today, you know, and that was about it. So those big giant herds that we always think about out in the Great Plains, that probably wouldn't have been the case here in Iowa. You know, you're lucky to see herds of about 100 or, or probably a lot fewer. The, some of the biggest herds that I've heard of would have been in Northwest Iowa, like 200, 300 animals. That would have been like when the Dragoons were going through and some of the early trappers and explorers and things like that, uh, that just happened to write down some stuff that day and, and talk about them. But they never said, was it a cow-calf herd or a bull group or, or anything like that. Yeah, you got a question? Um, so are there still bison left? Yeah, uh, we don't have any wild ones. They're not like deer that you can just go out and see in the woods or the grass, uh, but people have them on farms and they're in some parks. So if you, there's some parks around you can go to and you can see them behind a fence. Yeah. Me, somebody talked about Buffalo Bill. When I think of bison, I always think that about a program, a federal program to 
exterminate the bison in order to uh, conquer the Indian nations. Can you speak to that? Yeah, actually that's a story that's been kicked around a long time. And it's one of those that uh, I guess we'd call it like an urban legend or a rural legend. Um, it's one that people have repeated for a hundred years and it's probably been written up in history books. But uh, if, it, if you dig back to the original source of where that came from, um, it was actually in Texas, it was in the early 1900s. And it was at like a big reunion celebration like of Civil War vets and Indian fighters and things like that. And it was at the time where we had nearly wiped out the bison. You know, there's maybe a few hundred left and people are kind of like sad about this. Like, how did this happen? How did, and so here's all these guys that, you know, they'd gotten out of the Civil War and probably had some PTSD and didn't really fit into civilized company anymore. And so they wandered out west. And what were they good at doing? Shooting their rifle. And so here was money to be made. Hides were selling like hotcakes. You know, everybody back east wanted a buffalo robe to wrap around them and that one horse open sleigh when they're going to grandma's for Christmas. And so buffalo hides were the hot commodity. They knew how to shoot a gun. And these are kids that are like 18, 20, 26 years old. And they were out there shooting. And that's how they made their living. And they didn't think about it. There's, this is how I'm putting food on the table today. And then 30, 40 years later, now they're here in you know, 1905 or whatever, and they're saying, how could you do that? How could you wipe out this you know, American icon? And so one of the guys that was one of these old buffalo hunters was like running for Congress or something. And you know how politicians sometimes make stuff up on the spot when a reporter asks them questions? <laughs> he said, well, it was the government. They told us we had to do that to wipe out the Indian, take away his food supply. It wasn't our fault. Government orders told us to do that. And there was no like Snopes.com or anything like that back then, no internet fact checkers. And so people wrote it down and that story spread and spread and spread and spread. And when historians have looked into it, they said, oh, actually there wasn't really any government order at all. It was just a guy happened to say it one day and everybody else repeated it. Um, but you know, the real story was just, it was a bunch of young guys, you know, fresh from the war looking to make a living. And, you know, they were doing what they could to make money. In fact, um, when the Transcontinental Railroad went through, it pretty much divided the last of the bison into a southern herd, like in Texas, Kansas, Oklahoma, and a northern herd up in Montana, Wyoming, and Canada. And they wiped out the southern herd first, and then they started in on the, the northern herd. And they said when the, the last bison were gone, like in the you know, end of the 1800s, there were still guys sitting around the saloons in Miles City, Montana, that they just knew they were coming back any day now. They're up in Canada, you know, eventually they'd migrate back south and they're just waiting, waiting. Then they'd start making money again. And they waited and they waited and they never came back. And so those guys got ranch hand jobs and worked in the saloon and settled down and became Montanans and, and the bison never came back. But they fully expected just any day now, they're gonna show up and we're gonna start making money again. And so, uh, I mean, there was definitely wholesale slaughter. You always hear the stories about, you know, the rich guys on the train using them for target practice and all that happened. And, and you hear about the, you know, shooting them by the hundreds to feed the army and stuff and that happened. And, and especially the hide trade, that's what really wiped them out. Um, but it was, you know, guys in their 20s, they could put together an outfit, you know, a wagon, a few mules and maybe a partner or two get themselves a good sharps rifle, something they can shoot long distance with a big heavy bullet. And uh, you know, they'd station themselves in some town and then they would go out, outskirts where the big bison herds were. And uh, usually what they would do is get up on a high ridge, a glassing knob, where they could just sit and they would watch. And you know, in the movies, they, they run in on their horseback with guns blazing, right? Boom, 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 like Buffalo Bill Cody and they drop all over. And that's really not the way it happened for the most part. Um, usually they'd sit and they would watch first. Anybody guess what they were watching for? What's that? His tail going up. Well, no. <laughs> they were far enough away. They didn't care. They weren't getting run over. No. Well, they, they could see them out there milling around. What they're looking for is that lead cow. They wanted to find out who's in charge and will shoot her first. Boom. She goes down. Remember, we're far away, right? There's no big bang. Just a poof. And all of a sudden, this cow stumbles and she falls over. And all the other ones were like, huh, what happened to her? And they don't stampede off in the distance, they just kind of stand around, and then you pick off another one. Poof, poof. Oh, what happened to her? So they called it making a stand. And what they were looking for wasn't the big trophy bull, like you hear about people wanting to shoot today, it was that young cow, the one that had the nice, even hide, 
that would make a great blanket that they could sell back east. And so they'd, they'd look for the younger females, the one-year-olds, the two-year-olds, and they would as much as they could skin for a day. Anybody guess how many bison that was? How many, how many would they shoot at a time? Anybody know? About 10. <laughs> Skinning 10 bison is a full day's work. And so, yeah, it wasn't the big massacre. It was 10 this day, 10 tomorrow, 10 the next day, 10 the, you know, over and over. And it wasn't just this outfit. It was the next couple guys over in the ridge and the guys over in the next valley. And all that day after day, year after year, eventually wiped them out. So you shoot 10 bison. Those are big. Right? Yeah, they're, they're big. Animals. No, um, you, know, you go up to one that you're getting ready to process. First thing you do is you reach in and you cut out the tongue and you drop that in the brine barrel in the back of the wagon to pickle it because you could sell that at the saloon in town. People really like to eat bison tongue. My wife doesn't like to eat bison tongue. I fed it to her once when we were early dating. And she said it wasn't any good. <laughs> yeah, and here we are all these years later. <laughs> but they would get that and that was the main meat they wanted. And then usually what they would do is they would you know, make a, an incision from the neck all the way back down to the tail and up the forelegs and then across the head. And then they take big chains with hooks, like hay hooks, hook them into that front hide and then hook that up to their mule team. Giddy up, ha! And then peel that hide off like a giant banana peel. And sometimes they ripped, but most of the time they came off in a whole piece. And so um, really, they, I mean, 10 bison, think about shooting 10 cows. That's, that's like a family's meals for a whole year. There's no way they could eat that much. Yeah, so they just leave it. Maybe they'd cut off some, some of the, the top meat, you know, the, along the back, like your filet mignon, kind of, and uh, take that home for dinner that night. But other than that, they just left the carcass. And then the, the wolves would come, and the vultures, and the coyotes, and coy all the scavengers would just feast. Um, but yeah, there's, um, I think it's Theodore Roosevelt, or a contemporary, was talking about you know, riding through North Dakota and Montana in the late 1800s. And he always said, you know, for this 500 mile horseback ride he took, was never out of sight of a dead buffalo and never inside of a live one. So it was that point where there's just carcasses littered, but you couldn't find a live one. And so, yeah, like Hornaday and Roosevelt and those guys in their late 1800s, you know, when they went to Montana and North Dakota, you know, they wanted to shoot a bison because they thought, well, in a few years, there's not going to be any left. I want to get one before they're all gone. And they looked and they looked and they looked to just find one. So, yeah, it was I don't think tough. Everyone has seen the hide. Could you... Oh, yeah, I can hold it up. So, yeah, this is what they're after. And like I said, this is a, a male. So it's not as soft and, and as even from front to back as a, a female would be. But this is about the size of a two-year-old. So this is what they're after. This would be the head here, shaggy hair in the top between the horns and the tail back there. But yeah, this is nice and thick. And not only could you uh, get a nice winter one and wrap up when you're going in your wagon, but the summer ones had really thick hide that they used to make uh, belts for the factories back east. All the new industrial age kind of stuff that was going on. They wanted that nice thick leather to run the machinery with belt driven stuff. And so, yeah, that's what they're after. And then a few years later, five, 10 years later, um, there was kind of another big harvest, set her down, uh, where people went back out on the prairie and they started collecting all the bones that were scattered. And they piled them up by the wagon load and then they would grind them up for fertilizer. And they'd put them on people's gardens and crop fields and stuff. Yeah. Targeting the uh, young females in particular, that must have really been yeah, that's another thing too. If, if you were like a wildlife manager and you said, well, how can we make this population drop as fast as possible? Yeah, those breeding age females would be the ones to target. If you took out the older males, probably wouldn't impact them as fast, but yeah, hammering those breeding age females over and over and over, that's really gonna make it drop. When you yeah. talk about uh, the, the hunters just shooting one at a time or whatever, yeah. is there any one point where the other buffalo might go, What's going on here? No, they really You're don't. Leave. Yeah, they, they just kind of stand around. Now, I have heard some stories oh. out of Yellowstone. They're, you know, in the early days, they said there was, they called it mountain bison. 
which uh, supposedly was some other subspecies. They said it was smaller than a plains bison and almost dark black and super skittish. And they supposedly lived back in the Pelican Valley of Yellowstone. And when you'd come into these mountain meadows, as soon as they saw a human, they would just scatter and go back into the forest and disappear and you'd never see them again. Um, the genetics that they've done in the park these days doesn't indicate that there was any kind of, you know, remnant population, but that's what the old mountain men and the, you know, the early cattlemen talk about. Um, but yeah, most of your plains bison, you know, remember they're used to being chased by wolves, right? And so they'll herd up and they'll try to, if they're healthy, they'll push a wolf away from a calf or an injured member. And if, you know, it really gets them excited, then they'll start running. But if you're 200 yards away, they don't, and you're, you know, where they can't smell you, they just hear that little poof, poof, when somebody drops, and that doesn't register as a threat. And it's just like, oh, they're acting weird, you know, and they just kind of stand around. And I've seen that too with my own bison, like when we harvested them to, to sell for meat, you'd shoot one and the others would just kind of look. The only time I ever saw any kind of behavioral changes, um, some of the older bulls would be like, oh, that's that guy I was fighting with last summer, now he's injured, I'm gonna go beat him up. And they would come and they'd start horning him and, and sometimes they'd smell the blood and their tail would go up and things like that. But for the most part, they just kinda of all stand around. When you were yeah. raising bison, did you uh, find that they were inquisitive? Like yeah, cows? much more so than a domestic cow, more like a horse. Like if I'm out there digging a new fence post or something, say, they'll come sniff it. My and, car sat right up here and I was at uh, Custer's National Park yep. here. Sure. Road at me, and so I just stopped. Yep. And and then just let them pass. But they, uh, I had a nose print on the front of my car, and a lick <laughs> spot on yeah. the rear fender. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had them lick trucks and tractors and stuff before. Probably about the same intelligence as a horse, if I had to guess. You know, just kind of real inquisitive about what's going on, and you know, kind of always wanting to check you out. And if you're trying to to move them, you know. Short of having like helicopters and horseback riders and stuff, you can't really make them go anywhere, but you can trick them into going where you want them. Like if you, you know, let them graze one pasture and you got this nice green one over here and you open a gate, they're gonna wanna go through. Or, or you can uh, shake a bucket at them with a little bit of corn. If they know there's a treat in there, lead cow says, oh, I'm gonna get that corn and everybody else follows lead cow and, and then you get them all into the new pasture, things like that. But, but yeah, they, um, they can be challenging to work with in close confines. Out in the pasture, they're much easier to care for than cows because they're tougher and they survive the winter. They don't eat as much hay in the winter. Um, the calving is really easy. They drop at about 40 pounds. So you don't ever get stuck calves or out in the mud trying to pull them like I've done with domestic cows. So that part is easier. When you put them in a corral in a closed space and you're trying to load them, then it gets harder then you got to really kind of outthink them and, and do a lot of different things. Like uh, if they can see through a fence or a gate, they will try to go through it no matter what it is. If it's a solid wall and they can't see it on the other side, they won't even try it. And that could be a brick wall, could be a plastic tarp you just threw up. So they're, if they can see grass on the other side, they'll plow through it. And most of the time they'll get through. I remember one time I was moving some bison and um, actually, I had some domestic cows at that time, some, uh, some Charlays, and we took the steers and we were trying to load them up into a, a cattle trailer. And the bison had been hanging out with them for a while. This was a, about a year and a half old female. She wanted to be in with those cows that were going away. And so I had a big two inch tube gate, you know, big steel gate. And she just butted that thing with her head and bent it in a V. And then she hooked one horn on the bottom, went Phoom, and tossed it like it was nothing and then just trotted back in with her friends and said, oh, this is where I'm going. <laughs> Another time I was moving him, I had a two-year-old bull. I had seven foot gates around my corral and he jumped up and got halfway over that seven foot gate and was doing the teeter-totter and then finally backed off and luckily went where I wanted him. Um, but he almost made it over a, from a standstill up and over seven feet. So they look like a cow, but they can jump like a deer. And so you really gotta kind of just outthink them rather than trying to outmuscle them. So yeah. How do you fence them in? Well, see, that's the thing. Out in the pasture, they're fine. If you don't have them crowded, if they got plenty of room, um, I just use regular cattle fence and then I put some taller T posts like every third one or so and put another strand of barbed wire 
So as long as uh, at eye level, if you, they have a fence, then they usually won't try to jump it. If they've got enough food and water and salt and stuff like that, other bison to hang out with, they're pretty happy to stay in a pasture. So about five and a half feet tall is all you need. A um, friend of mine, he raised them for years with a high tensile fence. It was just like a couple strands electrified, but I mean, you could barely see it. Deer could slip through it like it wasn't there. And, uh, but they just respected it. You know, they got shocked once and they said, oh, hurts to go that way. I'm gonna go this way. And oh, my friends are over here and there's plenty of grass, I'll just stay here. He said the only time he ever had trouble is when he had two bulls fighting and they didn't even know the fence was there and they just went right through it and ended up on the other side. But yeah, as long as they got plenty of food and stuff, they're pretty happy to stay in a pasture. Yeah. What about inoculations? Is there anything that they need to be vaccinated? Yeah, if you want to, you can vaccinate them just like cows because they can get virtually any disease a cow can. Black leg, brucellosis, um, TB, all that stuff. So like when I raised them, you know, I had neighbors that had cows and I didn't want to cause any trouble. So we just would run them through the chute and have the vet give them shots and things like that. Um, give them wormer and stuff and all that and had fly rubs for them. You could do it just like cows. Um, at Neil Smith, at the wildlife refuge, their sort of philosophy is, well, these are wildlife. We're just going to let them do their thing. And so they bring them through a corral once a year. To, they put microchips in the new calves and they sort them and they get rid of some because they don't want to get too many on one spot. But like if one you know is out there and has a broken leg, they're like, well, it's just like Yellowstone has a broken leg and maybe it'll live and get better and maybe the coyotes will eat it when it goes down or something. Um, TNC, the Nature Conservancy, they treat them more like livestock where they give them inoculations and vaccinations and stuff. So it really depends on whoever's raising them. You can treat them as wildlife, you can treat them as cows or something in between. But Virtually any disease a cow can get, they could get to. Yeah. What do they do with the thin cows? Like when they get rid of some at Neil Smith, they go to other wildlife refuges or sometimes Indian reservations, things like that. Tribes that are trying to build up a herd and things like that. So there's a network. Yeah. Yeah, and it's actually pretty cool. They um, they take blood samples and hair samples from all of them, so they have full genetic profile of each individual. And so when they come through the chute, you know, like here's this bison, he's kicking and bunking and he's in the hydraulic squeeze chute. And here's the biologist on her laptop and she waves a wand over its neck and picks up the microchip, just like your dog at the vet. And it sends a message here and says, oh yeah, this one has three alleles that uh, are pretty rare. We better keep this one. Or, oh, this one, that's eh, pretty common genetics. Let's send that to the next herd. And they'll just sort them into the next pen by that. And so they can do that for individuals. It's pretty sweet. Yeah. Aren't they being reintroduced into the prairies now? A lot of places are, yeah. Um, they're using them as a management tool for like restoring grasslands and stuff. Um, when they graze, they, like I said, they eat mostly grass and they kind of don't really touch the wildflowers. And so it can help bump up your diversity of flowers and then along with that, your insects and your birds and everything else. Um, so yeah, it's definitely a tool for that. And it depends on, you know, where they are. There's private groups that are doing it. There's counties, states, you know, a lot of different groups are, are doing it. Indian reservations and things like that. I don't yeah. have a question, but sure. I for the people that are, would like to learn more, and especially yep. the kiddos, sure. but anybody, you could give a, a commercial message for the Neil Smith the Education Center. And the oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, they have all kinds of stuff up there and it's not too far away. There's a big bookstore, one of the best like nature bookstores in the state. And then, yeah, there's a big uh, nature center full of displays and you can drive through and see the bison and there's a movie you can watch and um, a lot of biologists answer questions. And, yeah, it's a cool place to go for sure. Do they have a campground? Uh, no, no, there's no campground there, uh, but Polk County Conservation has some campgrounds nearby that you can go camp out and go visit the park for sure. We're going to wrap this up soon. All right. We have a wedding that's going to start uh -oh. at 3.30 so we can, we can be on our way and they can be coming in for the wedding. And uh, we want to thank you. Yeah, for coming no problem. Today.